Hello, for joining us. Um, today, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Jimmy Goodman. Uh, welcome, Dr. Goodman. Thank um, you on the program today. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of a background uh, regarding you so people have a little bit of a, a so they know basically what we're going to talk about today. And then we're very excited to hear um, your presentation. So Dr. Jimmy Gutman is a certified emergency doctor who now practices family medicine. He received his training at the University of Calgary and made his residency at Emory University in Atlanta, where he was the chief of residence. Upon his return to Canada, he became the Director of Undergraduate Emergency Medicine Program and the Director of Emergency Medicine Resident Training at McGill University in Montreal. He's an, he has been an organizer of several international medical conferences as an, and is often heard on the radio and television throughout the world. Today, we're very lucky to have Dr. Gutman discuss the role of glutathione in health and disease with a special focus on autism spectrum disorders, which he is considered a world expert. So thank you so much for being with, with us today. Uh, bonjour and bienvenue. Um, and please, um, yeah, take it away. Merci bien, Jessica. Um, I really know the, 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 the honor is mine. Um, I, I, I love what you guys are, are doing. Uh, just getting good research and information out there to the field uh, in, a, in a, an easy uh, manner, uh, just providing just a lot of really tasty things for people to hang on to um, because um, well, we wish that that uh, community had had even more resources than it, than it, than it does. So, so I, I, I'm the one that needs to thank you. Well, thank you. And um, if whenever you're ready, um, we're very excited. Um, if you need any help, um, Enrique can pull up your slides um, and we can have a chat about glutathione and how it, how it connects to the ASD community. Okay, so I'm going to uh, just um, share the screen in, in a moment. Uh, here we go. So is that uh, showing up, Jessica? Can you see that? Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, you see uh, here a few of my books on glutathione. Uh, these are pretty digestible. So even if you're not a scientist, they're, they're relatively accessible and uh, certainly represent an exhaustive survey of what's been studied about this molecule. Um, for those of you who want to keep on top of what's happening in the world of glutathione research, um, please feel free to drop into uh, one or all of the various sites you see here on the screen. Um, you're going to find a lot of information there uh, that you'll probably find interesting and, and certainly reaching well beyond the field of ASD. Um, you'll, you'll find out the rather broad reach that glutathione has on so many different health challenges. Um, of course, it's important to make any audience aware of any conflicts of interest. So as you've heard, I do write books and, and I do benefit from their sales, as well as I consult to a nutraceutical company that makes a glutathione precursor. And finally, in both the United States and Canada, there are very strict guidelines as to what can be said about any approach that's not registered as a drug or a treatment, uh, whether the research validates it or not. So always, always ask your health professional before adding anything different, uh, whether it's a natural supplement or otherwise uh, to your health routine or to your kid's health routine. Um, if you pick up any natural supplement in the United States, they're all clearly marked that these products are not to be related to any medical claims. You know, that's just the way it is. But Please be aware that there are efforts to expand these statements made about natural products in both countries. Uh, you will see things evolve over, over the next few years. But this will and must be based on good, solid research and human, human uh, clinical trials. And speaking of good science and research, um, the website pubmed.gov is the foremost source of articles available in the world. Now, a lot of the people on the call today 
actually <laughs> log into this daily. Uh, it's an essential tool for the sharing of scientific information for all of us. So for those of you that have not heard of this site, it's it's critical to anyone doing research. But I got to warn you, it's a rabbit hole and you may end up in that rabbit hole spending hours, weeks, <laughs> and months of your life. So here you see I've punched in to the search box in, in PubMed um, two terms, glutathione and autism. And the graphic here shows the amounts of papers written in different years. And what's most noticeable is that there really was nothing going on until about 2004, and then boom, an avalanche of, of papers uh, that started being published. And so why? Why all of a sudden? What happened in 2004? Well, this groundbreaking study was published. It came from a team led by Dr. Jill James, who for many of you is a familiar name, uh, working out of Arkansas, <laughs> of all places. Uh, and this paper was exceptional news to everyone in the autism research community. And what they did was um, collect blood samples of both uh, children with autism and those without, and compared them for a whole host of different biochemical markers or, or blood tests um, that related to a metabolic process called methylation. Now, I know most of you are familiar with these terms, but I want to be sure to keep uh, the parents and the non-scientists um, in the loop here. I, I know that, yes, there are a lot of doctors and researchers looking at this, but there's a lot of other spectators that are avid, have avid interest in autism. And so I, I, I want to uh, make sure that what I'm talking about is understandable to those people, especially. Um, so they looked at these markers or blood tests that related to methylation and, uh, and the antioxidants and free radicals. And this impossible to read little table here shows the results. And if you want to go into detail, just remember pubmed.gov and enter the name of this study in, in the research window and you'll, you'll get it. But let me give you the bottom line here. Listen to this. Just about 80% of the kids with autism had abnormalities in glutathione functioning. This is relevant, relevant information. So what is glutathione? You know, we could spend hours talking about this. And of course, I've written many books on this topic. But for those of you who are new to this field, new to this word, it's a molecule that occurs naturally in all of our cells. And the understanding of its many roles this expands every year and getting back to pubmed you're going to find over 160,000 articles if you enter glutathione in the search tool now i, I just want to put this into context what does this number mean um, if you were to enter vitamin c you'd get back 70,000 results if vitamin e you get back around 45,000 results. Glutathione will get you more articles than vitamin C, C and E put together. So if uh, any of you out there have not heard of glutathione before, it will become part of our regular language in due time. And what exactly does glutathione do? Well, um, really, we could talk about 50 or 60 different things that it does uh, on an intracellular level, but let's look at four that are easy to remember uh, using the word idea, glutathione. What a great idea. I stands for the immune system. Uh, very simply, um, people who are immunocompromised generally have low glutathione levels. Um, if you optimize glutathione levels, you end up optimizing immune function. And again, there are hundreds and hundreds of papers looking at this. D stands for detoxification. Um, the highest levels of glutathione to be found are actually in your liver, which is, of course, 
your major organ of detoxification and it detoxifies thousands of different recognized substances and uh, again fascinating research uh, it is a critical source of energy the e is for energy and uh, here we're looking at uh, the function of our mitochondria those little structures in our cells that serve as batteries as, as an energy source these mitochondria need to have a a consistent and good stream of glutathione reaching them in order not to literally burn up and stop working and and finally a uh, this is the one that most people recognize glutathione has been called the master antioxidant now why would we use a term like master antioxidant because if you look at the way all antioxidants work um there is no antioxidant that we know of vitamin c vitamin e and 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 thousands of other none of these antioxidants can work properly without the presence of glutathione so you're starting to get an idea why it's such an important molecule now let's let's swing towards uh, autism asd um in in the next sequence of slides you know i was going to get into several metabolic pathways where glutathione has direct relevance to asd but i, I got to tell you after dr richard De this presentation last week uh, on the same webinar series my explanations would never do this justice that was just a, a phenomenal overview of what's going on on a molecular basis so so uh, Dr. Deeth, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so let me just flash uh, some of this is onto your screen. So if you want, you can access these and, and look, them at, look at them at your own pace uh, after this webinar is posted. Uh, you'll see one pathway where folate and B12 uh, abnormalities uh, relate to the MTHFR gene. Um, uh, here's a transmethylation pathway. Uh, uh, here's a common endpoint, uh, the transsulfuration pathway, which results in, in glutathione production. Um, but really, um, I, I, this, is, this is rather complicated. And if you want me to walk you through all of this, you can access an older lecture that I have uh, online. Uh, you see the YouTube address there. Uh, just uh, if you're going to do that, pour yourself a nice large cup of coffee. But better still, uh, the best, the most eloquent ever view, uh, eloquent overview that can be found on this is is really Dr. Deeth's presentation <laughs> last last week. Uh, you you'll find this archived at the Autism Research Coalition's website, uh, and and I know. Uh, that I speak for many doctors and scientists, that much of what I know about the biochemistry of autism, I learned from Richard. So thank you, Richard. So yeah, uh, these are tough slides for, for many of you, uh, but just to refine it down into simpler terms, really simpler terms. Number one, glutathione is intimately related to methylation pathways. Uh, number two, uh, glutathione is equally intimately related to the MTHFR gene uh, dysfunction. Uh, I may suggest that the, the, uh, the parents who are listening invest in some relatively inexpensive genetic testing that can determine uh, many MTHFR gene abnormalities. It absolutely blows my mind that these are available online for about a hundred bucks. You know, for this 66 year old doctor, this is still science fiction. Uh, and sorry, sorry to, to show my age. And um, uh, number three, the, the blockage of glutathione production can be bypassed by the provision of what we call bioavailable cysteine. In other words, the problem may lie in glutathione insufficiency, and we might be able to get around this issue by jumping in at the pathway at a later point 
with a dietary intervention. Yes, a dietary intervention. So put differently, um, at the most basic level, glutathione augmentation seems to be a critical key way to intervene towards making a difference. So um, what I'm going to show you here, please, this is very important. Um, if you're going to remember anything, remember this. Glutathione cannot be raised by eating glutathione. See, glutathione is made within your cells. And the way to raise your glutathione levels is to give your cells the building blocks, what are called precursors, so your cell makes its own glutathione. Please remember this, eating glutathione just is not an efficient way to do that. You need to give your cells the essential nutrients so it makes its own glutathione. And uh, where do we get these? Well, in Canada, we have a book called the CPS, a Compendium of Pharmaceutical Specialties. In the United States, this is a very familiar book to many of you, um, the Physician's Desk Reference or the, the PDR. Uh, one of these books sits on the desk or in the desk of every single doctor and every single pharmacist in North America. And if you were to look up glutathione precursors, uh, you'd find uh, two substances. One is a, a, a drug called N-acetylcysteine. Uh, many of you have heard of NAC before. And something else that's not a drug, it's a natural product called Immunocal, which um, I guess uh, generically the best description would be a cysteine-rich whey protein isolate. Now, um, with this knowledge, you know, about glutathione and autism that came out in 2004, I was compelled to start investigating this because I was involved with that um, cysteine-rich whey protein isolate. And I had to do this very cautiously uh, because it, it, th this kind of study had not yet been done using a protein precursor. So here, here's the, the, the paper. Um, from back in 2008, uh, the oral tolerability of cysteine-rich whey protein isolate in autism. Now, this was a pilot study, so there wasn't uh, a ton of patients in there, but we had to um, show a few things first. Uh, not only was it important to establish that the concept was sound and had the potential to be further investigated in larger studies, but there were challenges from the autism community about whether this was even a safe idea. So let me explain, as, as, as uh, most of you know, um, there are selected dietary restrictions that, that seem to have shown benefits in these kids, and certain foods have, have been shown to be potentially problematic. And, and one food stuff that was often eliminated with success uh, from autistic kids was uh, dairy or, or, or dairy products. Um, now, in my experience, many problems with dairy, besides the obvious you know, issue of lactose intolerance surrounding dairy products, lies in its casein content. Casein is just one of the many sub-proteins, so to speak, that you could find in milk, and it represents the most common protein allergy in dairy. Now, I, I knew this substance very well, uh, um, uh, this isolate, and I, I knew it had the casein removed. And, and furthermore, I knew that some ASD individuals were already taking this product for, for, for other reasons, and they seemed to be doing well. Um, eventually, uh, it was discovered that why casein was problematic in uh, ASD and, and other neurological issue, issues, but by guess who? Um, Dr. Richard Deeth, no surprise there. So this small study was a success. Uh, the kids were trending positive and the, the, the tolerance didn't seem to be an issue. Um, and, and now the great thing is that small studies lead to large studies. And so uh, a fantastic group from Nova Southwestern University in Florida took to the task. 
Um, and I, I got to, you know, I got to tell you, human studies not are difficult, but human studies and ASDs are especially difficult. Um, there are still no fully diagnostic biochemical endpoints. Uh, the etiology is variable. Uh, the kids obviously require a different level of consent and, and on and on and on. It, we actually started this uh, study 10 years ago. And here we have fresh publication in 2021. Improving antioxidant capacity in children with autism. Um, and this was led by Dr. Anna Kasajan and, and uh, her excellent team from Nova Southwestern, which included members of uh, what's called the Mailman Siegel Center, a major autism research organization. Just a ton of work, really well done. And, and you'll see in the title, uh, this human study was randomized and double-blinded, uh, placebo-controlled, and, and all the other features of a gold standard study. Uh, the intervention that was used uh, was the glutathione precursor called Immunical. Again, best described as a cysteine rich whey protein isolate. I also need to mention that the whey protein needs to be undenatured. Uh, oh, undenatured, it, it really needs to be handled very, very gently. It needs to be in the same uh, physical structure as you find it in nature. And uh, in the manufacture of uh, uh, most uh, whey proteins, there's a, there's a lot of stuff going on, and the protein just breaks down, changes shape, and becomes what we call denatured and just doesn't work very well as a glutathione precursor. But this one is manufactured with those specs in mind. And this very busy slide, um, uh, it's looking at the behavioral parameters that were measured. And I'll get into that in a moment, but I urge that all of you researchers and clinicians um, that are watching this uh, to access this paper on PubMed, and, and you'll see the coordinates there um, at the top of the slide. Uh, please, please, please take a look at this. So um, here we see that glutathione levels were greatly improved with the use of Immunical. Uh, you see that uh, in the green uh, bar, um, as opposed to the red bar, which represents the uh, placebo group. So we fully expected th to see this, but it, it really is, is critical for everyone else to uh, see the documentation and its statistical validation. And finally, the question that is way more important to the clinician, to the parent, to, to the kid, um, is that are they actually feeling and doing better? Has it affected their quality of living? You know, sometimes um, uh, some pure scientists get, get <laughs> way too focused on lab results and, and biochemical tests. Uh, my background as an emergency doctor, I really, my question is, how are you doing? And uh, how are these kids doing? Uh, and uh, they were doing well. And when we look at the measurements um, pertaining to the, the skills of daily living, socialization, a reduction in maladaptive behaviors, uh, these got better um, across the board. Um, and I, it's important, I, I need to mention it, that despite the efforts uh, to randomize these kids into treatment placebo groups, a, a closer analysis of their behavior at, at the start of the study showed that the placebo group um, started off with better than the treatment group. In other words, the treatment group showed better scoring at the end of the treatment. If the treatment group showed better scoring at the end of the treatment, that would imply that the intervention was even better than the numbers show. So things were kind of a little bit stacked against us statistically, but uh, we overcame that um, quite clearly. Now, here's where it gets a bit more complicated. There seemed to be a subset of ASD kids that did much better than the overall population of the kids examined. This was important for us to tease out because since this is the first major study of its kind, uh, it gave us information that perhaps 
there is a targeted group of autistic patients that may benefit much more from this strategy. Remember, ASD, it, it, it's such a, a, a heterogeneous phenomenon. So lack of a better term, uh, we separated the groups into responders and non-responders, even though the non-responders <laughs> showed improvements. So, so look at these, these, these two um, tables here. Uh, overall, the ASD kids improved in the areas in the blue lettered box. Uh, very promising. But but look at the responders in the green lettered box. Look at the amount of statistically relevant improvements in behavior parameters that resulted. Improvements on top of the other group in adaptive behaviors, communication skills, e even gross motor school, uh, skills. So so this needs uh, this uh, needs a um, much closer look. So uh, what was uh, a responder? Well, what features were, were, were present there? Well, two things. Um, it, these kids were by and large older than the non-responders. Now, considering that the kids in this study were between the ages of three and five, you can appreciate that five-year-olds are dramatically different than three-year-olds. Um, the number two, the, the, the responders had higher baseline measurements of glutathione. They started off with slightly better glutathione levels. So how do we make sense of this? Well, number one, um, it may be possible that the physiology of these kids being older, uh, they'd had time to evolve over these important developmental years and is somewhat different in older kids than in younger kids. And given that we looked at three to five year olds, clearly we need to entertain looking at a study at a broader age range, for example, three to eight year olds or, or, or something similar like that. And because the responders started out with a slightly higher glutathione level is very relevant. Um, number one, maybe there's a threshold where glutathione levels need to be so that these kids are functioning better and that that threshold was just easier to reach with the dose that was supplied. And number two, uh, which in my personal opinion is, is has a strong likelihood, uh, more kids would show more positive results if the dose was increased. Now, given that the intervention was so well tolerated and has been on the market for, for, for uh, 25 years, uh, this is not an unreasonable suggestion. So yeah, I, I would like to see further studies done and I'm actually going to take advantage of this call and, and make a call out uh, to those of you out there who have the means and skills uh, to make a research proposal. Uh, I, I'm, I'm so optimistic about these results. And in my personal crystal ball, I see this as a viable and accepted tool in the future. So um, thank you very much for your attention. And I'm going to try to get the screen back to you, Jessica and Enrique. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. Those were amazing results. Um, I yes. And I do hope that you can get, um, I feel that like you're saying, like a bigger study, maybe a little bit older kids to see exactly, um, you know, obviously to replicate that study could be an amazing thing for um, the community and to see where, where we can all fall on there. Um, and Absolutely. so if you have some time for like just a couple of questions. Um, sure. They can, is that okay? Um, Absolutely. That would be wonderful. So Alex had a good question. Um, he was asking, he said, have you heard of the precursor called glytine, G-L-Y-T-E-I-N? And if you had any thoughts on that. Yes, I, yeah, I, um, I've always got my ear to the ground about uh, uh, and glutathione precursors. And uh, the, the issue with the glytine is that I, I, I think that really uh, in order to be comfortable um, with with any substance, um, natural or otherwise. 
um, you you need to accumulate uh, good studies and and uh, moreover, um, no one's going to hang their hat on anything but uh, human studies, uh, placebo, randomized, uh, all of those terms that you hear us uh, bouncing around. And a one study or two study is just, just um, they're interesting. Uh, two studies, far more important, far more important than double one study. Uh, three studies are more than triple one study. But you, you, need, you need to have a, a bunch of these things under your belt. And, and, and this is why, um, for example, in, in Canada, um, I started off talking about um, making statements about natural products. In Canada, uh, we are a little bit progressive here when it comes to natural supplements. Um, the government will allow you to make uh, some quasi-medical claims about natural products. And this Immunical product, uh, this glutathione precursor, um, has... Uh, and authorized um, to be able to make statements of that taking Immunical will improve your, your immune function. And this can only be done by submitting a whole bunch of research, which has to include at least two well done uh, um, gold standard human trials. So yeah, glycine, I mean, it's interesting. Let's wait a couple of years and see how that pans out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I feel like we need to just, as a community, get together and fund this. And, you know, <laughs> I, I know there's so many kids are there between, you know, and now it might not be double blind placebo controlled um, study, but. But, um, but what, seems, what uh, a community you know, this is. I mean, it, it, what, what, what I've always found fascinating is the, the incredible level of, and sophistication of the parents of these ASD kids, um, they are one of the most well-read populations I've ever seen. It, it just blows my mind. Yeah, I think that for most of us, um, none of us imagined being here. Um, I think it's not something that most of us saw coming. Um, and so I think when you're thrown into a situation to where there's very few answers because in the general medical community, they're just flabbergasted that they are, you know, they don't know what to do. So as parents, right. um, I think that we're incredibly lucky that we have people that have either been thrown in that situation and have therefore taken it on as a, their job. And some of them wonderfully were in the medical community yeah. and they have that extra, you know, those extra brain cells that some of us are lacking. And then they can <laughs> really, you know, dive in. I mean, we're, I totally agree. I mean, yeah. I think it's, it will be the parents truly of this community that will change. Yeah. Um, it will change the, the trajectory of ASD moving forward. Um, that's what I truly believe because I think that there's, like you're saying, there's no other uh, community right. that I know of personally right. where you have parents that are so involved and are so right. willing I mean, to it, it's happening already. I mean, look, just look at your organization. I'm mean, fantastic. Look at Enrique. Enrique blows me away every day. Yeah. I'm like, Enrique, yeah. how many brains do you have in that head? I tell you. Um, so yes, I do. And we appreciate that as well. Um, so there's another, I actually had a question regarding the study. Um, were there yes. any, um, uh, anybody who was um, not included in the study? Did you have to have a certain ATEC score or a certain, like, did you need to be verbal? Because, you know, sometimes there is this, um, you know, uh, um, you know, for, I can't speak, but if you're either like mildly autistic or maybe you're moderate to severe, were there any um, yeah. disparities between that? Yeah. Uh, so, so every good study will have what's called inclusion and exclusion uh, criteria. And the, uh, Inclusion criteria for, for, for this study, for example, was between the ages of three and five, uh, had to have a confirmed diagnosis of, uh, of uh, ASD, uh, did not include other forms of ASD like tuberous sclerosis. Um, and it, they could not have been taking certain supplements that may have interfered with glutathione levels. So a, a full accounting uh, of those inclusion and exclusion criteria um, are available on the study. So, um, so if, if, you know, when, when people look at this and, and you go back to uh, the screen where I had the, the title of the study, they're real easy to find, uh, find it on PubMed or elsewhere, and it'll, it'll clearly out, out, 
outline this, but really we were took it, we were taking, if it's possible to say, typical cases of autism, if if such a thing exists. Yeah, and I like what you actually had brought up in your presentation, which I think so many parents are pushing for. Um, it's it's hard when you have again, there's a, a plethora of studies, but when there are, there's obviously it's more apparent that there are subtypes of ASD. Yes. So to group everyone with ASD traits in a this big big umbrella um and then just to choose you know your specific criteria but it really does a disservice i think to the results um that sure. were, they're not more you know again across the board saying like okay this is this subtype and this which of course right. is hopefully right. evolving into that but um couldn't agree more with what you said well you um, know i'm gonna i'm gonna take what you said um, and 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 really um i'm gonna make a really dumbed down analogy um, just imagine if we treated all diabetics the same and we didn't consider there's type one diabetes, type two diabetes, you know, that's craziness. So yeah. we need to be able to, uh, look at autism the same way. It's way harder, but yeah, we, we need to look, we need to look and stratify this, this area a little bit better. Well, it's an interesting thing that you bring up because I think that so often, you know, especially in the mainstream medical community, it's just considered, um, you know, just, oh, you have ASD, like everything that comes along with it, whether it's GI issues or whether it's like something extreme like head banging, and they just pass it off as ASD. And so like you're saying, it's just being that you can show a study. And again, it's 28 kids, it's, but it, it had great results. And of course you have to replicate that study, et cetera. But yep. being that you're showing improvement in behaviors of ASD, which again, yep. it, ASD is not a, it's, it's a behavioral diagnosis. So if you can show improvement in the traits of ASD, you know, that just, it just pushes it more and more that ASD is medical, which is what we tried to push um, um, at the Autism Research Coalition, because we know that if you're feeling better, you're going to do better and yep. um, you're going to just everything about you is going to be better. So yep. I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> um, Lucy had a funny just comment. Uh, yeah. I think when you were talking about the glutathione levels and how they increased and how the kids are yeah. five and how you thought it would ob obviously they would be even better as the kids are older. And she said she's 52. So she's wondering where she falls on the glutathione um, scale. So I'm not sure. We don't have a test for you, Lucy, at 52, but um, you never know. There might be an adult study out there. <laughs> well, um, yeah, well, this is this is very interesting. Um, the testing glutathione levels, um, they're even available online, but I have to tell you that the ones that are commercially available um, are really not very accurate, specific, or, or, or any of that. Uh, when we do our studies, uh, uh, we set up a specific laboratory with somebody who's expert in doing it. Uh, we need fresh, we'd like to get our samples fresh. Uh, need, they need to be spun down in a, a centrifuge right away uh, because we want to extract the white blood cells, the immune cells, and look for the glutathione levels in there. Uh, so they're, they're, it's technically difficult and expensive. Um, but um, I, I, in the future, I think this is once some another brilliant mind figures out how to do this cheaply and 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 effectively uh we're all going to be getting our glutathione tests done on a regular basis and if you're 52 um you're going to be relatively glutathione deficient yes. um, because um the older we get um every decade that we go beyond age 20 uh, we lose about 10% of our glutathione levels. So there are many, many diseases of aging where we demonstrate glutathione deficiency at the core. And uh, so we're doing a lot of work in in, uh, in cognition, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and, and, and that type of thing as well. Um, it, uh, and I totally agree with you. That kind of actually segued into a question from Kelly, which was asking, what's the best way to test uh, for glutathione levels? And as you're mentioning, it's very expensive. Um, but are there any, is there anything on the market currently that you would recommend either in the Canada or, or in the U.S. Um, as something that might give you the most accurate uh, numbers for your glutathione levels? Really um, you know, um, I, I, I'm not going to 
identify certain laboratories, but I'm going to make a general statement. Okay. Um, I know this sounds crazy, um, but you're not going to find a 20 or $30 test that, that's any good. Um, you, you probably, the more money you spend, the better it's going to be. It's just like, you know, buying a car. Um, you can just trust it more. And um, you also need to know when you're getting your glutathione measured, what exactly is being measured. Is it whole blood glutathione? Um, is it what we call lymphocytic glutathione, which comes from measuring the glutathione in the white blood cells, your immune cells? Is it oxidized or reduced glutathione? Is it the ratio between oxidized and, and reduced glutathione? So it it's complex. It's complex, but it's coming. What, what you need to look at are the studies where glutathione measurements have been done in different demographics, in different um, disease entities. Um, for example, I will tell you somebody with chronic infections like, like AIDS are going to be by definition glutathione deficient. Someone my age uh, is by definition going to be relatively glutathione deficient. Um, uh, somebody under great physical or mental stress are going to drop their glutathione levels. So I think that maintaining glutathione levels is important across all populations because we are day by day barraged by things that are going to lower our glutathione levels. And by raising glutathione levels, you impart a certain added defense both environmental and environmentally, and believe it or not, even genetically. Um, and now we're starting to understand the large role that epigenetics plays and the links between epigenetics um, and glutathione and methylation and, and, and all that. So um, I, I'm sorry to give such a complex answer uh, to that, but, um, if you're 52, you need to be looking at your glutathione levels. Just go ahead and raise them. Um, I I think we we have uh, uh, maybe Jessica has a, a problem with her internet connection, okay. um, but but I I think I think we we um, we we were we we're at time actually. Uh, so so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Goodman, for, for this great uh, overview of, of glutathione. And we're really looking forward to- uh, I'm sorry, you know, I don't know what happened to my internet. Just decided yeah. to hang out. I no, no, we, 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 no we, I was just kind of, you know, thanking Dr. Goodman for, for his for his time today. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, I, I, I think that we will be actually, uh, um, uh, you know, gathering all the all the questions uh, that we keep uh, that we keep getting, uh, Dr. Gorman, if that's okay, and we're going to be, uh, you know, sending those in, in an email uh, to you. Uh, and you know, thank you so much for your time. I mean, this, I just this have one last fantastic. thing. I wasn't sure if you were able to get it. I wanted to ask Nancy's question because I think it is a question that people might. Um, they're gonna. Everyone's gonna be out there like googling immunoco. Immuno, immuno, yeah. yeah. Say um, And her question was, um, is it available to purchase immunoco? Um, the book? Oh, um, the supplement, the book. The supplement, yes. Yeah, yes. No, okay, all, all available. Thank you very much uh, for, for throwing in a plug for my book. That's great. Yes. Um, there was, <laughs> there was, there was, uh, there was a, uh, at the front end of the lecture, there was a website there, uh, glutathione.org. Uh, you can get the books there. And uh, certainly the, the, the product is available. And, um, Again, uh, I need to be careful because it's a natural product and I don't want to be saying that this natural product can treat, cure, prevent and all that nomenclature used by um, regulatory offices. But uh, um, I, I'll, it, 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 I can handle those kind of inquiries um, uh, more eloquently on uh, if, if you send me the 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 questions and, and the okay. whatever email addresses and I'll make sure that someone takes care of that. 
Wonderful. No, we would absolutely love that. Um, and so, sorry, I got kicked out. Someone doesn't like what I was saying, apparently, on the internet. But um, but thank you so much. Uh, we absolutely appreciate you being with us, Dr. Gutman. Um, and um, I'm sure we're all going to go back and look through your slides again because they were still a plethora of information for our community. So um, thank you so much again. On est très content de parler avec vous aujourd'hui. And thank you and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. And thanks for inviting me. You guys are doing great work. Merci. We appreciate it. Bye-bye.